You can save 15% or more at Amazon when you pay with Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash. Just go to purse.bogosity.tv. You can set your own discount. 5% gets you fastest delivery, or you can set it to 30% or more if you're not in a hurry. Purse makes it so easy to save money at Amazon by buying with crypto. Just go to purse.bogosity.tv and start saving now. Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the week of March 15th, 2020. The podcast that's stuck in a loop, 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 stuck in a loop. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's resystematize the news of the bogus. The Open Source Initiative, or OSI, is the organization that basically defines for many what it means to be open source. It was co-founded by Eric S. Raymond, or ESR, because these guys apparently really love their initialisms. ESR wrote a book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which is a really good book you can read for free, I'm linking to in the show notes. So OSI banned ESR from their mailing lists and won't say why or even really acknowledge that they did it. This is part of a disturbing trend in open source organizations, which has seen Richard Stallman forced to resign from the Free Software Foundation and attempts to drive Linus Torvalds out of the Linux Foundation. So according to Raymond on his blog, quote, I, OSI's co-founder and its president for the first six years, was kicked off their lists for being too rhetorically forceful in opposing certain recent attempts to subvert OSD clauses 5 and 6. Yes, another initialism. This one stands for the Open Source Definition. Clauses 5 and 6 are anti-discrimination clauses. 5 reads, The license must not discriminate against any person or group of persons. And 6 reads, The license must not restrict anyone from making use of the program in a specific field of endeavor. For example, it may not restrict the program from being used in a business or from being used for genetic research. So the OSI is actually working against these in many ways. Admittedly, some of them are things that listeners to this podcast may like, such as prohibitions against open source software being used for warrantless surveillance, but it still goes against the basic principles behind open source. Raymond continues, This despite the fact that I had vocal support from multiple list members who thanked me for being willing to speak out. It shouldn't be news to anyone that there is an effort afoot to change, I would say corrupt, the fundamental premises of the open source culture. Instead of meritocracy and show me the code, we are now urged to behave so that no one will ever feel uncomfortable. The effect, the intended effect, is to diminish the prestige and autonomy of people who do the work, write the code, in favor of self-appointed tone policers. In the process, the freedom to speak necessary truths even when the manner in which they are expressed is unpleasant is being gradually strangled. And that is bad for us. Very bad. Both directly, it damages our self-correction process, and in its second-order effects. The habit of institutional tone policing, even when well-intentioned, too easily slides into the active censorship of disfavored views. The posts in question were made over a two-day period and are publicly archived. No one can seem to find any of these posts where Raymond actually violated the OSI's code of conduct. The main email that is generally speculated to be the impetus for this banning reads in part, I reject the persona non grata clause and all other attempts at so-called ethical open source licensing in the strongest possible terms. To get entangled into this sort of thing would not merely be against OSI's charter as expressed in the OSD, it would invite second and third order effects that would be gravely harmful. Whatever hypothetical good might be done in individual cases by denying the use of open source code to putatively evil persons and organizations would be swamped by the systemic harm from enabling people to use open source licenses in political vendettas, because such precedent, as Thomas Paine understood, always comes back to bite you. There would be no end to the feuds, the divisiveness, and the erosion of freedom if we went down that path. When Raymond disappeared from the list, the anonymous and unaccountable moderator at opensource.org posted, The OSI board is aware that some offensive emails have been sent to this list. The OSI does not tolerate deliberately divisive or disrespectful messages from any quarter. We have already taken moderation actions to this effect, and we will apply further sanctions if necessary. They didn't say why. They didn't even mention specifically that they were talking about Raymond. 
But Josh Birkins of Red Hat, an influential speaker at open source conferences, wrote, ESR's sharp language is not an attempt to persuade. It is an attempt to intimidate opponents, to win an argument by making others afraid to participate. Indeed, even today, OSI mailing list composition is entirely folks with enough privilege to be resistant to personal attacks. That's a sad, terrible thing. It's not free speech when it's an attempt to shout others down so that they have no voice. It's something else entirely. Further, not one of ESR's points is original or even original to this list. In his absence, not one of the ideas he so colorfully expressed will be lost. In the meantime, we're missing the input of so many people who will not participate in OSI because of our tolerance for wholly uncivilized behavior like his posts. Again, he didn't point to any actual posts of Raymond's where he did anything like that. And then board member Pamela Chestek posted, Following an incident on open source initiative mailing lists, the board has removed a subscriber from both the license review and license discuss mailing lists for repeatedly violating the code of conduct. No, she doesn't say who it was, but it is interesting that one of Raymond's emails was directed to things she had said and done. None of it was a personal attack against her, just his disagreement with the policy. Quote, Although we have failed in this instance, the OSI continues to work on making the email list safe environments where all people and viewpoints are greeted with an open mind and treated with dignity and respect. OSI has a broad constituency, and that remains a fundamental asset to our mission. Understand, they won't even tell Raymond what he supposedly did wrong, or even which post or posts it was. When Brian Lunduk reached out to Raymond, he got this reply. They never told me specifically which message was the cause. In fact, they haven't publicly admitted to banning me, though I got an email telling me I had been banned. Lunduk also reached out to OSI, but so far they haven't responded. Of that, Raymond told him, Don't hold your breath waiting. Full political ass-covering mode will be in effect now, and you can quote me on that. These people are an utter disgrace to the ideals on which I founded OSI. Raymond said that the root cause of the issue is, quote, the fetishization of nice behavior, where nice ends up being defined as being any behavior some self-appointed censor doesn't like, usually and in this case accompanied by a lot of baffle gab about inclusion and diversity so that anyone who isn't a fan of the new censorious rules can be cast as some sort of bigot. Abolish codes of conduct and all the Orwellian doublespeak that goes with them. It's less bad that people sometimes got their feelings hurt than it is to institutionalize a means by which dissenting opinions are crushed under the rubric of not nice. Lunduk points out that some of their board members are up for re-election, so it might be interesting to see how that goes, but this is yet another big step in the disturbing trend of fake inclusivity and diversity being used to destroy everything the open source movement has worked so hard for decades to establish, which is true diversity and inclusivity, that everyone is able to use, copy, modify, and or distribute software for any purpose. It just may be that the woke left will be able to do what not even the major copyright cartels could accomplish. If you're tired of these promos, regular supporters get the podcast early and ad-free. Just go to donate.bogosity.tv and sign up for Patreon or Subscribestar at any level. Ads are annoying, but ad blockers prevent publishers from making money. What if you could support your favorite websites, YouTube creators, Twitch streamers, social accounts, and many more ad-free and without paying anything, and even make some money yourself? It's not a pipe dream, it's airtime. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and get the browser extension and you'll earn cryptocurrency for the sites you visit, and so will the publisher. This is not a crypto miner. You and the publisher will both get part of the reward from current miners of the BitTube cryptocurrency, with no middleman taking a cut. Even if the publisher hasn't signed up yet, his tube will be put into a dedicated wallet that he can claim upon sign-up. You can also use your tube to tip publishers and even purchase products. Airtime monetizes users and publishers with no ads or crypto miners. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and start making money now. 
that's not the only threat to openness and security we face. We've covered over and over again the outright hostility both Democrats and Republicans have to people having secure encryption that no one, not even law enforcement, can intrude upon. It's very telling that their latest attempt, the Earn It Act, tries to hide this ultimate motive, even though every thinking person can see that's what it's for. The full title of the bipartisan bill is the Eliminating Abusive and Rampant Neglect of Interactive Technologies Act, introduced by the names we've heard over and over again, Senators Lindsey Graham, Richard Blumenthal, Josh Hawley, and Dianne Feinstein. And as we've seen, the latest justification for this is what's become known as CSAM, or Child Sexual Abuse Material. Using that as an excuse, the Earn It Act absolutely revokes Section 230 protections by holding providers and developers responsible for actions their users take, essentially forcing them to open up communications for the purposes of scanning for CSAM. Yes, this bill threatens both encryption and Section 230. In order to get their common law conduit rights back, because remember, that's all Section 230 is, they need to follow best practices to prevent proliferation of this material. Just one problem. There aren't any best practices. So the bill creates a government-appointed committee to say what does and doesn't qualify, effectively giving them selective control over who is and is not allowed to transmit data over the Internet. Cybersecurity expert Matthew Green said in his blog, quote, In short, this bill is a backdoor way to allow the government to ban encryption on commercial services. And even more beautifully, it doesn't come out and actually ban the use of encryption. It just makes encryption commercially infeasible for major providers to deploy, ensuring that they'll go bankrupt if they try to disobey this committee's recommendations. It's the kind of bill you'd come up with if you knew the thing you wanted to do was unconstitutional and highly unpopular, and you basically didn't care. He goes over why this is so important, quote, At the end of the day, we're shockingly bad at keeping computer systems secure. This has expensive, trillion-dollar costs to our economy. More than that, our failure to manage the security of data has intangible costs for our ability to function as a working society. There are a handful of promising technologies that could solve this problem. End-to-end -end encryption happens to be one of those. It is, in fact, the single most promising technology that we have to prevent hacking, loss of data, and all the harm that can befall vulnerable people because of it. And the CSAM issue is, as he says, a non-starter. Quote, some technologies, like CSAM scanning, will have to be reimagined, and in some cases their effectiveness will be reduced. But tech firms have been aggressive about developing this technology on their own, and they will continue to do so. The tech industry has many problems in many areas, but it doesn't need senators to tell it how to do this specific job, because people in California have kids too. If the U.S. Senate does decide to tell Silicon Valley how to do their job, at the point of a liability gun, you can bet the industry will revert to doing the minimum possible. And remember that Backpage was essential in law enforcement catching a lot of child predators and sex traffickers, and government shut them down anyway. We've covered how the loss of Backpage and the Craigslist personals has actually hindered law enforcement in their efforts to find these monsters. His conclusion is basically what any knowledgeable person will agree with, quote, it's extremely difficult to believe that this bill stems from an honest consideration of the rights of child victims and that this legislation is anything other than a direct attack on the use of end-to-end -end encryption. And here's hoping it goes the way of all other such attempts. If you're on the Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or hotel, anyone on that network can get your traffic. Do you really trust all of those strangers? For that matter, do you really trust your ISP? A VPN can protect you from prying eyes, disguise your location, and even foil government sensors. It's essential in this day and age, so go to vpn.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to BoxPN. Starting at just $2.99 a month, you can get unlimited high-speed connections to VPN servers all over the world, and they don't log connections, so your privacy is assured. Traveling abroad, just VPN home, and don't worry about what those other governments are doing. Back at home, stop your ISP from traffic shaping and messing with the quality internet access you're paying good money for. 
you can connect from multiple machines at once, including your smartphone or tablet, and it supports all the secure standards, including OpenVPN and SSTP. Bypass sensors and surveillance with your own secure VPN connection. Go to vpn.pagosity.tv. Here's a bit of good news in the Manning Assange saga. Even as the psychological torture of Julian Assange continues, a court has ordered that Chelsea Manning should be released from prison a day after her suicide attempt. As we covered, when Assange was captured, Manning was imprisoned again to try and coerce her testimony against him. She refused to comply and has been treated to psychopathically harsh conditions ever since. It seemed to be nothing more than complete vindictiveness and an excuse to get her back in jail after Obama had commuted her sentence. The main problem is that the DOJ already has access to everything they need. They have all of Manning's communications with Assange. They have her testimony on all of it from her court-martial. And no one could point out what else they could possibly have needed from her. And yet, they kept her in prison, which, considering her history with suicide attempts, was unconscionable. In fact, the grand jury was disbanded without her testimony at all. It's horrendous that it took another attempt to do it, but now the U.S. District Court has found that her continued imprisonment can serve no just purpose. Unfortunately, they upheld the $500 a day fine the DOJ is putting on her, which as of the court decision totals $256,000. But if her testimony isn't necessary, isn't the fine as pointless as the incarceration? I guess they're fine as long as they get the money. We live in a world where light bulbs connect to the internet, and recent attacks on them prove that your online security is under threat like never before. Not only your websites, but the internet-enabled devices you buy. And the biggest problem is weak passwords. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords on the web and on your internet-enabled devices, all protected by one master password. LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers, all your computers, and even your mobile devices, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers, backup sensitive documents, software licenses, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications, manage passwords for your entire family, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now. And now it's time to desanctify this week's biggest bogan emitter. And this week it goes to the Jehovah's Witnesses, specifically their supervising body, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Over a decade before this podcast began, even a decade before I was on YouTube, I was warning people that the DMCA could be abused to get someone's personal details. Since a DMCA response requires that the person give the claimant their name and physical address, this could be abused by dangerous people. I have been proven right many times. What's different about this is that the accused didn't even respond and they're still trying to get his identity. Reddit user Dark Spliver is a self-proclaimed member of the Jehovah's Witnesses. He was posting videos of JW videos and services and the Watchtower Society tried to get them taken down under the DMCA. It's funny because don't most religious organizations want people to spread the word about what they're doing? Why should they want to hide it? At any rate, they sent a subpoena to Reddit to get the personal details of Dark Spliver. He reached out to the EFF, who defended him on the basis that the subpoena was invalid since the material was covered under fair use, and fortunately, the court agreed. But as we've seen in the past, fair use is a very iffy and unreliable concept. Which the Watchtower Society apparently realizes because they're using the same tactic against a YouTuber called JW Apostate for leaking Watchtower videos and sermons. They claim they wanted his identity to defend their copyright and not at all to retaliate against him in any other way, trust us. Shortly after Torrent Freak reached out to JW Apostate for comment, 
all of his videos as well as his Reddit account were deleted. The Watchtower Society is now suing Google to try and get them to turn over his identity and personal information. And this time it's different. District Judge Kathy Seibel granted their request and ordered the clerk to issue the subpoena. In fact, since June 2017, they've made 60 applications overall for subpoenas for users' personal information. By the way, they're using the same law firm as the Scientologists. Yeah, I'm sure this is just about copyright, and not at all about silencing criticism or getting the personal details of apostates so they can engage in real-world harassment of them or anything. It's just another cult of cockroaches who don't like the light. And so that makes the Watchtower Society this week's biggest bogun emitter. I want to tell you about the eyeglasses I've been wearing for years. As people can see on my videos, I have a very strong prescription, which makes glasses more expensive, especially when I need computer glasses, reading glasses, prescription sunglasses, and most expensively, progressive lenses for general everyday wear. To save money while still getting quality glasses, I get them from Fermu. In fact, I just got a pair of progressives with high-index aspherical lenses and a nice pair of frames my wife loves for just over $100. It would have been $500 to get them through my eye doctor. Not only do they look good, the glasses are durable. I've worn many pairs for several years without problems. All orders come with a 30-day return policy, a 3-month warranty, and one-on-one -on -one customer service. Go to Firmoo, that's F-I-R-M-O-O dot Bogosity dot TV, anytime you need quality glasses at a low price. Once again, that's Firmoo dot Bogosity dot TV. And now let's upregulate this week's... Idiot Extraordinary! And this week it goes to the CIA, and you might remember the Vault 7 leaks. We covered a few of those a while back that were of interest to the public as a whole. It detailed, among other things, how the CIA used hacking tools and malware to engage in spying and even cyber warfare. They were published on WikiLeaks, and Joshua Schulte has been accused of being the leaker. What's funny is that the information that's becoming public about this case is almost as revealing as the Vault 7 leaks themselves. Not only has the defense completely picked apart the CIA's seemingly watertight case against Schulte, showing him to be nothing but a fall guy, but in the process the CIA has been shown not to be an elite crime-fighting force protecting America from cyber threats abroad, but a group of idiots who really don't know much at all about cybersecurity. Script kiddies, to use the term from the hacker scene. One thing that is known, because both sides acknowledged it, is that Schulte found ways back into the CIA's systems after he was kicked out. So the question became, just how did he get back in? I'm sure if there were a movie about it, it would be an ever-escalating battle of wits between the lone hacker and the group of world-class experts. Instead, he did so merely by accessing the machine with its password, which was 123ABCDEF. Yes, the Central Intelligence Agency secured the virtual machine holding all of their hacking tools with the password 123ABCDEF. And the root login for the main server was MySweetSummer, in all lowercase. Those of you who are head desking right now might want to keep your heads down, lest the next one give you a concussion. Those passwords were shared. The entire team knew about them and used them to access the group's intranet. Why would they think that this was a good approach? Because this intranet was restricted to operational support branch members, the elite unit making the hacking tools. Not so elite as it turns out. And believe it or not, all of this started over a rubber band fight. Schulte was engaging in a petty feud with another employee named Amal, who was given an office with a window while he wasn't. The fight escalated to Nerf guns. Schulte actually kept detailed notes about everyone he hated, which included pretty much everyone he worked with. And that's really the story about how he's being sent up the river, because a forensic study of every device he ever touched at the CIA resulted in no piece of evidence that couldn't be refuted that he was the one who disclosed the hacking tools. If a jury finds him guilty, it'll be because they find him to be a reprehensible human being, which it seems he pretty much is, instead of someone whose guilt has been proven beyond all reasonable doubt, because it hasn't. 
The fact is, the CIA's operational security is so laughable that we may never know who leaked the tools to WikiLeaks. One CIA witness after another said there were no controls, users were sharing weak passwords that were stored openly, there were no audit logs, and basically anyone who was ever in the location could have connected to the intranet just by plugging in a cable and getting full access to everything. The CIA didn't even have a clue anything was taken until they started showing up on WikiLeaks, and the CIA had come right out and said that if the data hadn't been published but given to an adversary, they still wouldn't know it had been lost. If anything, they lucked out by having it leaked. So all of that makes the CIA this week's... Idiot Extraordinary! Well, that wraps up this This is Fargan War edition of the Bogosity Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please keep this podcast going by hitting like and subscribe and supporting in one of several different ways you can find at donate.bogosity.tv, including PayPal, cryptocurrency, or subscribing at Patreon or Subscribestar to listen early and ad-free. Also, please come to discord.bogosity.tv where you can join the discussion and post a question, statement, news article, or rant. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Thomas Paine. He that would make his own liberty secure must guard even his enemy from oppression, for if he violates this duty, he establishes a precedent that will reach to himself. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution on Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. are annoying, but ad blockers prevent publishers from making money. What if you could support your favorite websites, YouTube creators, Twitch streamers, social accounts, and many more ad-free and without paying anything, and even make some money yourself? It's not a pipe dream, it's airtime. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and get the browser extension and you'll earn cryptocurrency for the sites you visit, and so will the publisher. This is not a crypto miner. You and the publisher will both get part of the reward from current miners of the BitTube cryptocurrency, with no middleman taking a cut. Even if the publisher hasn't signed up yet, his tube will be put into a dedicated wallet that he can claim upon sign-up. You can also use your tube to tip publishers and even purchase products. Airtime monetizes users and publishers with no ads or crypto miners. Go to airtime.bogosity.tv and start making money now.